Hello and good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending this evening's webinar, Clinical Application and Case Studies Applying the TCAV Method of APRV. I would like to welcome all of you to the second part of this webinar series. Myself, Winnie Sivilak, and I'm also joined here with Ed Coombs as well. Thank you so much for being a part of this great presentation. I'd like to go ahead and introduce both of our speakers this evening. First, Penny Andrews. Ms. Andrews has been a critical care nurse for over 25 years, starting in the Neurotrauma Critical Care Unit at Shock Trauma in Baltimore, Maryland. Her current focus is critical care research, both clinically and scientifically, with a concentration in mechanical ventilation and understanding the pathology of acute lung injury, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and ventilator-induced associated lung injury. She has the privilege of working clinically with Dr. Nader Habashi and scientifically with Mr. Gary Nyman at the SUNY Upstate Cardiopulmonary Lab. Our second speaker is Maria Madden. Maria has served over 29 years as a respiratory therapist a supervisor, an ECMO specialist, research coordinator, and an educator for the University of Maryland Medical Center at our Adams Crowley Shock Trauma Center. Currently, Maria is a clinical educator at Vero and ICON. Maria is also adult acute care chair for the AARC. Thank you, Winnie. Uh, thank you for that introduction and thank you everybody for sharing your evening with us. Um, my name is uh, Penny Andrews and um, I'd like to present to you this evening, APRV set as the TCAV or Time Controlled Adaptive Ventilation Method. And go through some clinical tips. Just my uh, disclosures, uh, none of the um, honorarium or work that uh, grants that we've ever received has influenced any of our studies or lectures. So first, just want to look uh, at this setting APRV as a mode versus a method. And I think you can see the difference here that uh, the uh, sorry, I'm just going to move this out of the way. The, um, both of these ventilators are set in the bi-level or APRV mode, but the waveform graphic looks uh, significantly different between this and here. And so although the ventilator has the mode, um, there is various ways that you can set any mode. And in this case, this is simply what we would call pressure control one-to-one. -one. As you can see on the left here, um, a P high of 36, a P low of 22, a T high of one second with a rate of 32, so it's uh, not even really a one-to-one. -one. Versus on the right-hand side here, you can see we have a P high of 32, but a P low of zero. And what we're doing is using time to control our end expiratory lung volume, or um, in another way to say we're setting the PEEP. So again, this is the method that I'm going to go over tonight, uh, which is um, uh, quite different from uh, pretty much any uh, literature that you see out there. We did a 30-year evolution of APRV. We did this paper um, uh, back in 2016, and what we discovered was the majority of the articles, the papers, the studies that are out there are really an inverse ratio pressure control with very little emphasis on the, uh, the T low. And I'll go over that in quite detail. 
So first, I just want to go through uh, some of the other, you know, settings in APRV. And uh, we use waveform graphics a lot to help us guide uh, lung volume, both on the um, uh, high side and low side. And uh, so the question here is, is the P high too high? And uh, one little tip that you know what we can see here is that the patient can take a spontaneous breath on the um, uh, during the CPAP phase on the P high but you can see a sustained expiratory phase here so the patient's pushing against this um, uh, this P high so in this instance this P high may be too high um, or is it not high enough? If you look here, any time that you see, uh, first of all, uh, some uh, hints here are that the inspiratory, the spontaneous breath is very narrow, very tall, which means the patient has a lot of effort to take that breath but can't sustain and hold that breath. And you can see here that the machine is delivering about 40 liters, but the patient's pulling nearly 80 liters. So again, when the patient's out flowing the machine that much, you may need to consider this, this uh, P high may not be high enough. Um, the P low, in uh, using our method, we use a P low of zero, decreases expiratory resistance. Um, the key with using a P low of zero, however, you must set your T low appropriately whenever you're using a P low of zero, because if not, if you uh, have the T low set inappropriately, it may be too long and you may actually go to zero. But why we can comfortably set our P low to zero is that we use time rather than pressure to control the end expiratory lung volume. As you can see in this graphic here, the gas flow comes out of the uh, patient's lungs, goes through the uh, endotracheal tube, you have uh, turbulence here, and then you have a big pressure drop being the ventilator circuit. And a conventional um, uh, method here would be to stop or slow down that gas flow uh, by using pressure or adding a peep. So instead, what we do is we use, first of all, the artificial airway um, is uh, an inherent PEEP. It's an inherent resistor. So you already have PEEP set here. So by controlling it with time, what you can see here is that pressure does not go from zero, let's call this 25, instantaneously. It gradually builds up in about over two and a half seconds, the pressure from the ventilator equals with the pressure in the lung. And then the same would be on the converse side, meaning that at the um, uh, P low of zero or the release phase, you're not gonna go from 25 to zero in an instant. You're gonna have a gradation here. And what we've done, um, um, my uh, colleague Maria and I, we actually looked at uh, 200 patients and measured driving pressure. And in the APRV group, what we um, validated was that the end, uh, the expiratory hold, when setting the T low appropriately and using a P low of zero, what we discovered was that the um, expiratory hold or the PEEP was about a third to a half of the P high. So we have plenty of PEEP uh, there. You can see that in a tracing on the green line here and in this, uh, um, this picture here. The T high uh, is essentially the duration of the CPAP phase. Now the patient can spontaneously breathe at any time throughout this CPAP phase. And here is a, uh, a generous T high patient is spontaneously breathing. This is a patient with what we would call normal or um, a post-operative um, uh, atelectasis lungs. But remember, in a rescue situation, your T high is going to be very brief because you need to bulk ventilate that patient until you gain surface area. So when rescuing the patient, you might see a T high of, excuse me, two seconds. And then you would gradually increase that as you gain more lung volume, gain more surface area, gas exchange, and the patient starts spontaneously breathing. Now we use time to aid in recruitment. And uh, if you look here, this is a, uh, um, a rat lung and uh, this is um, uh, on a loop here, but it looks like what uh, the lung would look like after one second 
I'll stop it right there, one second of inflation, and that's about all you get versus over here, if you use a T high of five seconds, that you can see you get a lot more recruitment over that five seconds, and it takes at least two and a half seconds to start opening the lung, so we um, allow time to help recruit on the CPAP side. Now I spend a lot of time here and a focus on the T low because I think it's really important. It's one of the the key factors that uh, um, uh, with using APRV, uh, using the TCAV method, uh, because this is very personalized to each individual patient based on the compliance or elastance of their lung. So the adjustment of the T low is based on the expiratory gas flow rate and what we found in all of our uh, clinical and animal studies were that the 75% is what you want for normal or acute restrictive lung disease. This does not take into account uh, COPD, which is completely different. Um, as a matter of fact, we just had a patient the um, other day with true true COPD um, and uh, the T low was two seconds. So, uh, and, and they were still retaining gas flow. We still couldn't get the lungs to empty. So that's more 25% of the peak expiratory flow rate. But this evening we're gonna talk purely about acute restrictive lung disease. So calculating the T low, how do we find out whenever we set uh, a T low, um, uh, an easy, a marker, let's talk about just the adult population. I think um, an easy setting would be just pick 0.5, anywhere from 0.4 to 0 0.6, 0 0.5, and then uh, figure out your calculation of where you need to be. And the easiest way to do that is you take your peak expiratory flow rate, so the fastest time coming out of the, uh, the lung, and then you multiply that by 75%. Your target you should set, in this case, if it's 100, you should target it to set at 75 liters. So I'll show you here. Here's an example. Um, if we have a T low, of course, set to 0, 0.0, that's 100%. There is no movement of gas and uh, there's uh, no um, uh, decline in the, um, uh, the um, slope here, the angle of deceleration. Here, if we have the gas flow comes out at 100 liters and we multiply that by 75%, we want to terminate at 75. And you can see here this is 75 um, liters. Now, someone mentioned in the uh, talk um, Tuesday night, I think it was Tuesday night by Dr. Abashi, um, uh, Wednesday night, whatever night it was, um, that some of the ventilators, it was quite difficult to, um, to find the, uh, where the termination was. This is what Dr. Bashi was referring to is you, you take this, um, uh, this line, which is your, your gas flow coming out of the lung and you draw a line there. If you take that and cut that in half, that's 50%. And then if you cut that in half again, that's 75. Um, so then also um, here is another, um, let's see, sorry, I'm gonna get rid of this out of my way. Um, uh, if you look at this here, um, this uh, on this particular ventilator you can actually measure the gas flow so you freeze your screen you take your rotary knob and you scroll over the fastest time point coming out of the lung and in this case it's 66 liters well so i'm going to take 66 multiply that by 75 percent my target or my goal is to terminate at 49 and a half liters well, in this case, it's 53 uh, liters. So it's pretty darn close and uh, we're going to, um, you can either keep it there or you can adjust it back in a, a fraction of an increment. Now, one thing is on uh, some ventilators, you can only go, let's say it's set at 0.5, you could only go from 0.5 to 0.6. And in that case, you might end up um, instead of 53, you might end up at 42. Um, you might have a big gap there. So 
in this particular case, you may want to consider writing out the 53. Um, and uh, if we did the math there, we can take, um, so what is that? It's not exactly 75%. So we'll do the math and we'll take uh, um, 53 divided by our peak expiratory flow rate of let's call it 66. And we're actually at 80%. So you can consider writing that out, see if that uh, is a little too much and, and uh, try to go from there. But other ventilators, you could go from 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.5 to 0 0.51, 0 0.52. So you could get very granular with your adjustments. Now, the angle of deceleration is very important to watch in guiding you as far as um, uh, loss of lung volume or recruitment. So in this case, we're going to look at uh, this one is set perfectly at uh, 0 0.5 seconds and it terminates at 75%. Everything's grand. Uh, the patient goes to the OR, they bring them back, they deliver the patient back to you. And at that same 0 0.5 seconds of release, you see it went from terminating at 75 all the way down to 25. So the big difference you can see here is the angle went from more of a 45 degree to about a uh, 30 degree or 25 degrees. It's much steeper. So what we would do in this case is we would simply adjust our T low back to 0.4 and it's going to move over this angle here, going to bring this down and then now we capture 75% again. Then, um, and this is a, a rendition that was a drawing. Here's actually a patient uh, where, where we transitioned over and we set our standard T-low of 0.5. Well, you can see very clearly here, this is a ha at the halfway mark. That T-low is way too long. So we brought it back to 0.35 and that was still at about uh, 72% um, uh, and then here, so we got down to 0.32. We could get very granular on this ventilator and we could set that now at 75%. So you can see a big difference between this one and the original. So uh, this was from a paper that we did where we actually watched the evolution of the um, angle or what we call here the slope of the expiratory flow. And you can see here a normal lung is at 45 degrees. It becomes more steep with the um, uh, as the ARDS worsens, it becomes even steeper. And here uh, again, just showing how you would need to adjust your T low on the converse. This is actually a patient that evolved through recruitment. And you can see the angle. We measured it here. It was at about 58 degrees of an angle, not the uh, termination percentage, but the angle. And that um, uh, was a T-low set to 0.3. But as we recruited the lung, we had to keep increasing the T-low because you can see it flattens and we no longer have that 45 degree angle. We're moving more closely to a 90 degree angle and it becomes very flat, meaning that we need to keep extending that out. So I put a few examples in here. Also, what is a peak expiratory flow rate? Really what D mark is that on the flow pattern? Because we get this a lot where people say, no matter what I did, I tried to get 75% and I couldn't, but that's because they were using this as their peak expiratory flow rate. Anytime you see a needle or a spike and really no decay, you have to mark that off. You have to strike that out and actually start at a point where you can see the um, deceleration. You can see the expiratory flow gas um, gradually decay. So mark that off, get rid of that, use this area here, that's your peak expiratory flow rate and you can uh, move that over. Same thing with these other two. Um, a lot of times that's either uh, circuit compression just from the gas flow coming out very fast, can be um, some secretions, uh, wet HMEs will cause that as well. But once again, you can see here, that would be the halfway mark. Here's the three quarter mark. So it's pretty easy to, uh, to f figure this out. You just take a little snapshot and you can look, okay, that would be 50%. 
So here I'm pretty close uh, at 75%. And uh, just another picture here, I just wanted to re-emphasize, strike this um, out, get rid of that um, aberrancy there. Here is where your actual angle starts. So this is where you're going to measure your peak expiratory flow rate would be this number. So this would be the halfway mark. This is the three quarter mark. And uh, just one more. Um, uh, example here because I do think it's important because we do get this a lot um, in this case uh, this is uh, to be stricken off we don't want to look at this here so our real peak expiratory flow rate is 55 liters and as we decay here then it, it terminates at 30 liters so where am I am I at 75 percent well if I take 30 divided by 55 I'm only at 54 percent so I'm going to need to be somewhere down around here. So I would tighten up that T low. I want to go through some factors that actually influence that peak expiratory flow rate. When you do see that needle, when you see that spike, what could be a cause of some of these um, uh, aberrancies that you see or uh, things that you should really look out for for the peak expiratory flow rate? Number one is the size of the artificial airway. We get this quite a bit that if someone was uh, emergently intubated and um, let's say they had a, a smaller ET tube and they wanted to bronch through that, but the, the ET tube is too small, so they had to switch it out for a larger ET tube. Be sure to check if you're on, uh, if you're using APRV and the TCAV method, you need to make sure that once you get that new airway in, that you adjust for the change in the diameter of that artificial airway. So if your endotracheal tube went from a seven to an eight, um, seven to a 7.5, you might need to make some adjustments there. If there are obstructions in your artificial airway, I'll go over some examples of that. If you set a P low, um, uh, it will affect your peak expiratory flow rate. It will slow it down. Uh, secretions and expiratory filters in particular. So here's an example, and you can see, again, a spike and uh, pretty much an obstructed uh, flow pattern. So gas flow is not coming out of the lung and a spike in. So this was uh, a patient where the T low kept getting adjusted more and more and more um, to the higher side to try to capture that. But um, uh, then when it was noticed that this was the problem, that uh, um, uh, miraculously, once the endotracheal tube was straightened out, um, the um, actual uh, gas flow pattern completely changed. And now you can see this T low at 0.9 is too long. So we would tighten that up. So always look at these signs. These are telltale signs giving you a hint that something's wrong. Don't just adjust the settings. Try to understand what the waveform is telling you. Here's one as well. Um, we, you can see a spike and you can see it's completely obstructed. And this was the offender here. Someone left uh, the inline suction catheter in too far, simply pulled it back. And again, uh, you know, miraculously, uh, because people kept increasing the T low to try to accommodate for this rather than troubleshooting the problem. So we pulled back on the inline suction catheter. And of course, now this T low is too long. So we would also decrease that one as well. Here's another example. Um, uh, the tidal volumes were uh, normally in the 7, 8, uh, 793, 800 range. And you can see here the, uh, the 424. So uh, look at the difference between these two patterns. This one has a big spike. And even though it has an angle, Clearly, we knew something was wrong with the reduction in the, um, uh, the tidal volumes, and this was the big offender. They hold a lot of resistance when they get wet and when they have uh, secretions in there. This is an example where a, a restrictive patient can become an obstructive patient, not uh, meaning that they, you know, uh, developed COPD over uh, when you went to lunch, but this was an example of a patient that had a nice 45 degree angle, except you can see there's a lot of 
a lot of ratty edges there. It's not very crisp, very clean. So there's some turbulence going on. And uh, come back from lunch, and then this is what you find. Well, pretty much figured that the patient didn't develop COPD while you went to lunch, but the peak expiratory flow rate cut down dramatically you have this spike and a complete obstruction. And this was one of Dr. Obashi's patients that um, uh, everything was checked. Uh, they, um, uh, they were checking for kinks. They were checking for any, you know, inline suction catheters, whatever. And Dr. Obashi asked, you know, can you suction this patient? And yep, we, we can suction and uh, we don't get anything. Nothing comes, comes back. But he knew the history of the patient. And this particular patient had um, a lot of pulmonary contusions. When those start breaking up, this is what happens. They completely obstructed this patient's endotracheal tube. So in this case, the patient was re-intubated and, um, uh, of, of course, the flow pattern completely changed. So it was, a, it was a, a sign here. And this is important to see when, you got, when you've got these ratty edges Look for secretions, look for water in your circuit, sloshing around. But in this particular patient, uh, um, what happened was it created basically a one-way valve. So the suction catheter could go in, but when they moved the suction catheter and pulled it back out, they, um, uh, the secretions kind of closed shut and obstructed the airway. Um, so uh, actually, you know, because of this, we, we found that there's a uh, secretion um, uh, mobilization and the movement of secretions um, that uh, there are a couple factors that actually really change this. One is recruitment. Um, as you open the lung, as you get gas behind a secretion, because that's the only way that you can move a secretion out of the airway, is getting gas behind it. And then that release has such a high expiratory flow rate that it moves the uh, secretions out. And we've seen this um, a lot over the years. And we actually started capturing some of this because um, looked back at, and uh, this is nothing new, we looked back at 1989 and um, uh, they looked at two-phase gas liquid transport. And this was a study done on sheep where they instilled a synthetic mucus. And they looked at the difference between expiratory gas flow rates when they changed the IDE ratio. So as you increase your IDE ratio, you have more stored energy. So your expiratory, uh, your inspiratory flow rate um, your, uh, becomes um, um, uh, higher and your expiratory uh, flow rate um, uh, on, on the um, normal, like on a, a, two, a one to two. But then when you switch over, your inspiratory flow rates are not as high, but your expiratory flow rates become much higher. And we see this with um, APRV. And this is an example where we switch over from conventional, from pressure control, and you can see the peak expiratory flow rate is about 40 liters. We switch over to APRV, it becomes 80 liters. Just that, just switching over, um, and again, that stored energy and uh, the movement of um, uh, gas flow. So what we did was we um, took this to the lab and we had um, some uh, respiratory therapy students in Syracuse that we were working with in the lab and they uh, needed to do an experiment. And so what they did was they looked at the expiratory gas flow rates. Now this is pressure control with a pressure set at 30 and a um, two to one, three to one, and four to one IDE ratio. Now you can see even on a four to one IDE ratio, it moves the secretions around a little bit, but they're always maintained in the balloons. And this is time time lapse video, but we lined up the timing the same on both videos. And here was a P high of 30, so we matched the pressures, they're the same, yet we had the T low set at 75%. And you can see here the dramatic difference that on initiation, you can see within a couple of releases, the balloons are empty. Where did it go? You can see all the secretions moving up in the airway and the airways become green almost instantly. And that is a feature of, um, uh, you know, again, a P low set to zero. So you don't have that resistance and that you can move secretions out of the lung. 
So we took it one step further rather than balloons. We actually looked and did this on pigs. And this was the TCAV method and looked at the acceleration of simulated mucus. So again, instilled mucus. And what they did was they measured this in two different modes. So using the um, uh, volume control, uh, setting it with the ARDSNET protocol and setting it with the TCAB protocol. And what this is here is the, T, um, the TCAB method with the P low set to zero, five and 10 and in ARDSNET, the PEEP set to zero, 10 and 20. And as you can see, APRV set at 75% with a P low of zero had the highest um, expiratory flow rates and the, the orange bar is the movement of the mucus. So you can see that, um, uh, that it, uh, the expiratory flow rates would decrease with the movement of um, the um, uh, of, the, of the peak expiratory flow rate would decrease with the addition of a P low, and uh, then the secretion uh, movement actually went down as well. And I'm sorry, the dash line, the dash line is the mucus movement. So you can see it was at its highest at 75%, and the movement of mucus went down. And with the ARGENET, there's actually no movement of mucus um, outside of the airways. And this is simply uh, another correlation plot that as you um, uh, your um, mucus movement increased in distance um, uh, as your peak expiratory flow rate was at its highest. So uh, we've actually been able to um, correlate this with a reduced amount of uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia also when using um, APRV in the TCAB method. So I wanna briefly go over pressure support. I think there was some questions about the use of pressure support with APRV. And uh, we do not use pressure support uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it changes the um, uh, nature of the breath. Uh, a pressure supported breath is decelerating. A true spontaneous breath is um, sinusoidal. So the gas flow pattern changes. Also, um, the other part is that the pressure support is delivered above the P high. So if you have, if your patient is at total lung capacity and this was triggered, you're actually putting that additional gas flow in above the P high and you could potentially injure the lung. Whereas, whereas here, it's an inherent feature that if you're at the P high, and the patient is at total lung capacity. Everybody take a big deep breath, hold it. Now try to take a breath on top of that. You can't because your diaphragms are flat. So even if you tried to move air, you can't. Whereas with pressure support, if you did that and just slightly triggered that, it would still be uh, pushed in on top of that. And here um, uh, are just a couple of graphics showing, again, the difference in the gas flow distribution, that all you need is a trigger here, you get a resultant gas flow, which typically outpaces the demand. Whereas a true spontaneous breath is um, the patient receives the flow that they get or that they demand. So as the patient initiates a breath and pulls, they get a resultant gas flow. The harder they pull, the higher this goes, and uh, the uh, less that they pull, the more sinusoidal it becomes. And Maria and I actually did um, uh, a couple of, uh, we did a study um, looking at 30 patients uh, with electrical impedance tomography, and we did a couple of other cases where we looked at um, uh, the gas distribution in the lung, looking at the difference between pressure support and CPAP. And as you can see, we looked at two, um, these are two different patients here. The patient on the left here uh, was at pressure support of uh, 10, PIPA 5. We matched that with CPAP. And you can see here that with pressure support, the, the largest amount of flow is being distributed just into this one area. Whereas if we switched over to CPAP, you had a more even distribution begin. And this was within minutes. So just imagine if we, you know, over time, what would happen? And what we found was that the distribution ventral 
moved to dorsal. So um, on pressure support, uh, you trigger, it pa follows the path of least resistance and goes into the anterior or ventral portion, whereas if you switch over to CPAP, it moved that uh, portion, increased the dorsal distribution by 13%. The same over here, another patient, um, a pressure support of 10, PEEP of 10 and versus a CPAP of 20. And you can see also that the distribution became more uniform, uh, increasing the dorsal regions by 7%. So I also want to briefly go over some T low issues because a lot of people talk about tidal volumes um, in APRV and uh, it's really important to figure out whether or not it's, um, uh, it's, it's what we call the T low kicking out. So if you set your T low, um, uh, there's only one ventilator that does not have um, uh, the ability to set pressure support on top of a P high, um, all the other ventilators have that ability, which means that it's originally pressure control and um, you have the bias flow. So anytime that you trigger, you can still move this, um, uh, this T low, it will move on its own. Even though you have the T low set to 0.5 seconds, you can see a big difference between these two um, pictures. On the left here, it's set to 0.5 and it's, it's measuring 0.5. I don't know if you can see the little hash marks here. Here to here is a full second. So if we move this over a little bit, that's 0.5 seconds. And um, the tidal volumes are about five, uh, you know, in the 500 range. All of a sudden, no change in the settings um, as, as far as the T low. All of a sudden, the T low becomes almost a full second it fills almost this entire gap of this one second, and you can see the tidal volumes um, uh, bust out to a liter. Same thing happens on the servo U. Um, you can see here a T low set to 0.5 seconds. Our tidal volumes are a liter. That same 0.5 seconds, um, you can see that they're um, a 546. So it fluctuates back and forth and back and forth. And um, one change here um, that we reduced the P high by one centimeter and it seemed to stop that. Um, in our experience, anytime you enter the 2930 range, it starts uh, behaving this way. Here's a video and uh, it just shows, um, I think this is kind of a, uh, um, a representation that you can see, boom, it kicks out. So you can uh, just stop it right here. You can see here, this width is much different than this width. Now let's watch the tidal volumes. They were 596 and let's watch them go up to over a liter. So again, uh, this, you know, is it really the, you know, the mode or uh, the features of this particular ventilator that's causing this? Uh, the same thing here, no matter what we did on this, this one, uh, we had the T low set to 0.4, we even set it to 0.2, it wouldn't budge. It was uh, almost a full second and we could not get the uh, T low to, um, uh, to be where we wanted it, you know, to where it was set. It would not uh, narrow down to that time. Just another example again on the servo. You. Uh, this one is on uh, the Covidian. You can see, um, I also have this on the 980, but um, uh, you can see here, this is just a still image, and you can see this little red dot. And this is where it sensed a trigger. So, of course, it believes the patient's trying to take a breath. It moves out the release over, and you can see the tidal volumes are 1800 cc's. Um, uh, on this one, it's a graphic. Um, again, patient takes a breath, and you can see here's a negative deflection. Patient took a breath, and a huge response. The tidal volumes went from uh, 800 to 2 liters. This is on the Avia. Um, it uh, um, also has uh, um, an issue here. It actually reduces the uh, T-low, so um, uh, it doesn't do it as often, but we have caught it uh, misbehaving there as well.
So I'll stop there, um, and I know that we're going to wait until the end of the entire uh, presentation for questions, so I thank you for your time. Great. Can everyone hear me? <clears throat> yep, we're good to go. Thank you. Okay, great. Great. Hello, everyone, and yes, thanks for joining us on a Friday evening. So I'm going to run through some uh, APRV case studies. I picked different ones. I think it's very helpful for us in how to set up APRV. Uh, starting out with a standard of care, using it from the time of intubation, rescuing a patient from ECMO, rescuing a patient from breast settings on ECMO, uh, APRV and driving pressure, and finally, APRV protecting the lung from a massive fluid resuscitation patient. Disclosures, and when you went through over my disclosures at the beginning. So just like Penny mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, we all know how to use volume control. And volume control can be using in so many different ways. But when you mention ARDSnet, it's actually describing a certain way of using ARDSnet, of using volume control. Same thing with APRV. If you read the literature, there's different ways of um, folks have used APRV. We're talking about a specific method here. Uh, using APRV, the TCAP method. So anytime I refer to APRV as well, we're talking about the TCAP method with APRV. So first case. So first case is using APRV TCAP as a standard of care. So this is a 52-year-old female from an outside hospital that was sent to uh, shock trauma due to a subdural hematoma, multiple fractures, and was intubated due to a MVC. She was 64 inches tall, weighed 246 pounds. She was in the OR for over six hours. Her settings were a volume control rate of 20, tidal volume of 450, PEEP of 10, 40%. Her PF ratio was 212, with that blood gas was 745, 44, 85. So now she was coming to the ICU and being transferred to APRV as a standard of care. So we're running through how we're going to select our settings, P-high, P-low, T-high, and T-low with these patients. So again, this is the patient. Her PIPs were around 32. Uh, we're in a volume mode, so we want to use our plateau pressure as our, our, as our P-high. Her plateau here was 24-25. So Every time there was there's a new therapist, someone new to APRV, I always ask, you know, how how did your patient do with the transition? Well, the patient didn't tolerate it. And they always talk about, well, they dropped their SAT, so I switched them back. So then I ask, what happened to the patient hemodynamically? And I get this puzzled look. And I get this puzzled look, especially with the, the newer therapists, because we forget to look at hemodynamics. What we do on the ventilator can also affect the patient hemodynamically. So yes, SATs drop, especially when you're transitioning someone over that has a lot of lung collapse, a lot of atelectasis, that wasn't seeing any gas exchange earlier. So if their SATs drop and your blood pressure stays the same, the patient stays hemodynamically stable, it's okay. Those area of the lungs are now seeing gas exchange for the first time in a while. So yes, SATs are gonna drop, but be patient. They will eventually go up. Where it's important to pay attention is if your blood pressure drops. So the key thing is to know your patient before you're transitioning to APRV. So APRV can achieve a mean air pressure, uh, usually two to three below your PHI. So we're achieving a lot higher mean air pressure than your stand from, from your conventional mode. So as therapists, an easy thing to do, again, always asking your provider, is doing an, uh, increasing your PEEP at least by 10. We're tracking to see if this patient's intravascularly dry. So if you increase your PEEP, and your mean blood pressure drops by 10%, the sign of patient being intravascular dry. There's other maneuvers you can do as well. One that we do a lot is a passive leg raise, which you're now almost mimicking a 500 cc fluid bolus to the patient. And you're really seeing if a patient's a fluid responder. So if the mean, uh, mean blood pressure increases um, by 10% when you're doing this versus the uh, um, increase in the PEEP, then you're seeing there are fluid responders. So increasing PEEP, you're increasing mean. If you see the mean blood pressure drop by 10%, and this, and when you're doing the passive leg raise, you're almost giving a like a fluid bolus. So if you see mean blood pressure increase by 10%, it's telling you 
about your patient, you know, might need some uh, extra fluid, something to talk to your provider about. And that would really um, make a difference when you're transitioning a patient that they don't actually de recruit, um, drop of blood pressure. Because once they drop their blood pressure, many of us panic, we put them back and we don't try it again. So just here, I uh, took some screenshots to show you. So a uh, patient on the previous settings, a rate of, uh, um, actually they were on a rate of about 20, uh, anyway, 10 of iron 450, but a peep of 10, um, it, a peep, here's a peep of five, transitioning this patient over with that plateau pressure of 25, I'm using that as my PI, look at the difference in my mean airway pressure. I am achieving a lot higher mean airway pressure, 9.5 versus 22. So again, do you see how much using the same amount of pressure that the patient was seeing previously, uh, I'm able to achieve a hot, lot higher mean airway pressure. So this is really important when we're transitioning patients over. P low as Penny went over, we're using uh, P low at zero. Uh, I think it's just uh, it's just really important that we're uh, we're creating peep um, by our time low, using that time to, uh, to looking at the patient's waveforms versus setting an actual peep based on a P, uh, you know a peep in FIO2 table. So you know, there's been ver various discussions. Um, it was on the ERC Connect, and actually someone even published an abstract on the feeling that using a PEEP greater than zero increases peak expiratory flow rates. We actually did this on 20 patients uh, at our facility. Penny and I increased our PLOs anywhere from, sorry, from zero, went to five, 10, and then 15, and monitored these patients. 16 out of the 20 patients had increased in tidal CO2s. Uh, several of the patients that were alert and responsive actually told us that we, breathing was a little harder. We actually see some of these patients increased respiratory rate, and you could actually see them just having the therapist monitoring, patients became more uncomfortable. And that's because we're increasing resistance when we're adding a, 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 a P low. So again, you don't need a P low if you're setting your T low appropriately. And again, we did demonstrate that the highest peak expiratory flow rate was using a P low of zero. So here, just looking at this closer, this is a patient we went from a PLO of zero to a PLO of five, and tidy CO2s increase um, from 39, this over, um, to 42, and you can see our, our uh, volumes actually also dropped, or release volumes, and the patients, the patients in tidy CO2s um, increase and the work of breathing increase. So transitioning this patient over, uh, we, using the, the patient's um, plateau pressures are P high, our P low was zero, uh, our T high, and I threw this in there because of, of newer therapists or newer to EPRV, you have a hard time transitioning a patient from a rate of 20 and thinking I'm going to go to the normal EPRV setting is a T high of four to six. So a lot of them, with someone that has a normal CO2 and a normal pH, you know, if, if we you know, panic and start using really short T highs, you're going to be overventilating these patients as this was. So a new RRTs, a lot of times we see them using the four seconds on a patient with uh, normal CO2, normal ventilation, and then the more experienced RTs get it. We don't need to use such a short T high. Five seconds works. So again, and the the reasoning for that is because we're spending more time at the high um, the high CPAP level. We have more time for gas exchange. So this is the transitioning the patient over uh, using that plateau. There's 25 over zero, and at four, you're going to be overventilating that, that, that patient. So again, just remember, uh, reviewing T high is a shorter your T high is, the more releases you're going to have from the high CPAP level, creating the higher respiratory rates. So we tend to normally say we start four to six, five is a good number to start with a patient that has a good a normal CO2 and, and pH. And Penny showed this one, and this is one of my favorite ones because this is showing you using the same amount of pressure, uh, how much you're actually opening the lung in one second. So most of the times in conventional modes, we're ventilating for one, uh, our inspiratory time is one second. And if you take that same pressure you were using and now uh, stretch out your inspiratory time to five seconds, look how much more alveoli you're actually recruiting. The lighter colors, what you see popping up is alveoli recruiting. All right, case two. 
This is using APRB as a rescue mode, and we're going to talk about T high. Because a lot of times when I hear therapists say, well, APRB didn't work, at, at, you know, is rescuing my patient. Well, we have to use our T high a little bit differently when we're rescuing a patient. Oops, this just jumped away from me. Um, so this is actually an abstract we published a few years back in Respiratory Care Journal. Uh, this was a 23-year-old male uh, who was in a high-speed MVC and a suffering um, uh, tension pneumo, bilateral pulmonary contusions, uh, lung, right lung lacerations, and a traumatic brain injury. He came in early in the morning at 4.30. They, they tried different modes, volume control, PRVC, and uh, his gas was uh, pH of 7.09, CO2 of 61, PO2 of 72, and his PF ratio was 72. On a rate of 22, tidal volume 470, PEEP of 14, and 100%. The therapist came in at 6.30 and found the surgical team ready to cannulate the patients. They're ready at bedside to cannulate. She said, give me one shot, one chance, let me try a PRV. And she did. And an hour later, this was her results. 736-29216, the PF ratio, trying to move these little boxes. Is 223. Look at the T high she used. It was 2.0. If if we had used this patient was on a rate of 22 and severely acidotic. If we would have used the normal four to six, yes, it, APRV would not work. So this, in these cases, when a patient's severely acidotic, we need to do bulk ventilation. So we need to match the respiratory rate, and and that's what the therapist did here. So within an hour of using it, look at the PF ratio from 72 to 223. She matched the respiratory rate, but we're still able to use a still a longer inspiratory time. So let's take a look at this a little closer. So how did she do this? So, so we the basic respiratory formula, 60 seconds divided by breaths per minute equals your total time. So total time minus the T low, and we usually start at 0 0.5 equals your, your, um, your T high. So in this case, 60 seconds divided by a uh, rate of 22 gives us a total time of 2.7. 2.7 minus 0 0.5 gave us a T high of 2.2. That would give you then a respiratory of 22. So you start at, at those settings, and then you know of course set your T low as Penny said to make sure we're, we're maintaining 75% of our peak expiratory flow rate. So the therapist ended up using 2.0, and this patient needed a T low of 0.65. And they got us the rate of uh, 23 breaths per minute. So again, think of a rate of 22. Your 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 eye time is a lot shorter than that. Here we can actually still do a high respiratory rate, and still use a lot longer T high, and still get that benefit of the longer inspiratory time. So I hope everyone understands this is just really important. And again, a lot of this is also on the APRV network on how to use APRV as a as a rescue. Again, this is now uh, APRV as a rescue. Um, again, how to set that T high. And this was the patient Penny just recently mentioned. This was a young male um, um, found down, um, was put on ECMO really quickly from the time of admission. It was in um, respiratory failure. Um, this was Dr. Habashi's patient, kind of maxed out on ECMO on a sweep at 10.5, nowhere to go, using rest settings on the ventilator on pressure control and this is what um his abg was 739 45 137 a driving pressure of 19 and you know and max out on our suite so dr abashi used aprv used aprv as a rescue or max out um, on on our sweep on removal of the removing CO2 from ECMO, so start using uh, use APRV as a rescue. So that means the shorter T highs we've been talking about. Um, this patient went to 29 over zero, transitioned over using the same plateau pressure as previously. Did a short T high to help bulk ventilate this patient. As you could see here, 1.8, and our T low is 0.46. And within hours, the patient was weaned to 26 over zero, and that's what you're seeing here. They started at 29, 
and monitoring driving pressure was already down to 12 within hours. And, and the sweep was cut in half from 10 and a half to five and a half just by using a PRV again, and still just using the same amount of pressure the patient was already uh, seeing. And, and as the patient uh, recruited, the driving pressure was uh, also decreasing here. Uh, it was down to 10.5, and you see the T-height uh, was being slowly stretched out as the patient was recruiting, uh, and, ventil and, and ventilation was improving, and didn't need the short T-highs anymore, and just stretching it out. So this is the patient on admission uh, on uh, day zero uh, transition from pressure control to, um, and then that same day uh, switched over to uh, APRV uh, rescue. This is day two on APRV uh, down to 26 over zero. And the patient was decannulated two days later. And this is patient's x-ray uh, day four on APRV. Again, you seeing the, the recruitment occurring. So great case. So we're going to get into my next case is a little bit talking about driving pressure because uh, this has been confusing to uh, many clinicians. So, oh no, the driving pressure is 38. And I actually had this from one of the physicians uh, questioning, I uh, had a patient on 38 over zero. And when driving pressure, pressure first came out, everybody knowing it's plateau minus PEEP and uh, this physician actually thought it was P high minus P low. So, and thinking it was 38 over zero. So as Penny has said, we actually went through and collected data on 200 patients. So in APRV, the driving pressure is P high minus the auto peak you're creating. And, and just like in the uh, Amaro study, best time to actually check driving pressures of patients that's not uh, actually uh, actively breathing. So you do an expiratory hold, we did anywhere from two to four seconds. Um, move your cursor to the end of expiration. Here, my my auto peep. You could say that peep I was creating was 27.6. Round that up to 28. My driving pressure then is 38 minus 28. It's a it's a driving pressure of 10. So it's just real important that we understand that, so we can also communicate that out to all the the providers as well. So um, here's the abstract Penny mentioned that we did on 200 patients. Uh, we collected on patients on volume control, pressure control, and APRV. Uh, this was an abstract published in ATS. Um, and the results were APRV had a significant lower driving pressure than pressure control. Volume control fell right in the middle. And you know we were lo just looking at the driving pressure, but ended up finding out the mortality rate on those APRV patients was a little less than volume control and, and pressure control as well. So I have to say, and driving pressure, going around checking driving pressure, really show me how important it is that the T low is set appropriately. So make sure your T low is set appropriately, as Penny went through, to we're maintaining at least 75% of our peak expiratory flow. Not 70, not 69, it should be a 75%. This is another driving pressure. Um, this was one of my patients, a little lady that fell down, went to the OR for surgery, as soon as she came out of the OR, we checked her driving pressure and it was 16 and that's her x-ray. So we didn't make changes as others, you know, some believe you should make then changes to make sure your driving pressure is less than 15. Some even, even say less than 13. And this is the uh, patient the next morning. And actually I took her screenshot because I was so excited about looking at her driving pressure. Same set settings on APRV of 22 over zero, but now her driving pressure was 9.2. 22 minus 12.8, you can see I did an expiratory hold here, and it was 9.2. And I was like really blown away by it. Well, the x-ray on the left is her x-ray that morning. So driving pressure actually really decreased in this patient because the patient recruited. So I think it's it's nice to use driving pressure as a, a tool to show you if you're moving the right way with recruiting or, or you're de-recruiting. Uh, instead of making vent changes, we really felt our APRB settings were appropriate. Her driving pressure was 16, we left it there, and we watched her driving pressure decrease. So again, PI minus um, the time constant peak you're creating equals your driving pressure. And again, I threw this in there because it's so important 
but make sure you're setting your TLO appropriately. So you measure it and it should be part of your ventilator assessment and your CRO only trapping 754%. Do something about it. Don't just document 54% and it should be part of our documentation. Store in the TLO. And I know Penny went through this. Again, so, so important that we're checking this part of our event assessments. If it's less than 75, you're making the short in the TLO. If it's 90%, that's too much as well. You need to lengthen your TLO. Again, and the importance of how the CT low set appropriately, we've seen it at bedside when we're uh, fine, just fine tuning the T low, taking someone from 50 to 75%, you will see their SATs improve because you're actually um, pre trying to, you know, preventing the recruitment. And then Dr. Abash and Gary Neiman all proved this in the lab as well, looking at, uh, at the alveoli during inspiration and expiration and trapping either 10 percent 25 and 50 and then to 75 percent you're seeing the alveoli being more stable uh and looking stable during inspiration and expiration again the tilo i think is so important not just looking at you know, the angle of deceler uh, deceleration that penny mentioned so important but what is that peak expiratory flow rate that tells you a lot about your patients Working in a trauma center, we don't usually know the history of these patients, but that peak expiratory flow rate can tell you a lot about your patients. Normally, we see anywhere maybe a normal patient, 50 to negative 70, a really someone with really stiff lungs, you'll see that get to eight, negative 80, negative 100. So that's telling you about the patient being really restrictive. And I've walked into an OR where they're using uh, APRV to ventilate a patient that they couldn't ventilate. They're like, we can't ventilate this patient. And I see the peak expiratory flow rate being negative 30, negative 20 on the patient. And they're trying to maintain 75%. No wonder it wasn't working. So again, this is our obstructive uh, patients, uh, a little harder to um, set, but as long as you really know how to inter interpret the waveforms. Once I stretch out that TLO out to 25, 50%, where it should be with someone with an obstructive lung disease, we had no problems ventilating the patient. So don't just pay attention to how much you're trapping, Pay attention to what that peak expiratory flow rate is as well. All right, the next one is using APRV to protect the lung from a massive fluid resuscitation. So this is a trauma patient uh, that was a 53-year-old female. It was in a, uh, involved in a severe boating accident where she was crushed between the boat and the dock. She missed her step. She was a went to the OR, uh, was in there for several hours uh, from a pelvic ring injury, was also placed on VV ECMO. Less than 24 hours, I want to say that this was less than 18 hours, she received massive uh, fluid resuscitation. She was just bleeding out. She received over 14 liters of uh, fluid and blood products. And again, this is one actually one of my patients that um, I was working ECMO, and I've never given someone this many uh, blood products and fluid between the nurse and I just pumping it into the patient. When we started the case, the patient was only on 18 over zero, uh, and she had great release volumes of 600. The TI was stretched out to 10 to help keep her lungs open. We were using our ECMO sweep to help us ventilate the patient. So as we're pumping all this fluid in this patient, we noticed now she's trapping less, it was getting to 60%, and her release volumes were starting to drop. We noticed also, um, so looking at the waveforms, you could see that um, it was cut in half, the, the termination expiratory flow rate. So the therapist then starts shorting the TLO from 0.5 to, to 0.4, as release volumes dropped, also went up on the P high. And this will happen throughout the night. And throughout the night, we saw volumes drop and shorten, we had to shorten the TLO. And it, 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 it is so important to pay attention to your uh, expiratory waveforms, but also the inspiratory. We saw them looking more like icicles. So the therapist went up to the uh, P high of 25 over zero. Um, by the end of our shift, we were at uh, T high of 10 and 0 0.35 on our T low. And this was her x-ray in the morning. So just like how nurses have to titrate levofed to the patient's blood pressure, we titrated APRV to what the patient needed at bedside. We saw release volumes were, um, were dropping. We saw signs in her waveform she was de-recruiting and the therapist made the appropriate changes to help protect the lung with this patient. So we didn't need, in, in other modes, a lot of times we wait um, 
through the morning till we see the ABG. Oh my goodness, the patient's not oxygenating well or ventilating well and waiting for a bad x-ray. Okay, we need to go up on the feet. But this is, I think it's just a great mode, uh, especially when you, you know how to interpret these waveforms and interpret, it's the patient talking to you through these waveforms, what's going on, the, the lungs are, and you're making the appropriate changes to help protect the lung. So it's a great way um, helping you protect the lung too. And then it's also important to pay attention when, as you're recruiting the patient, knowing when to back off as well. So I, um, I will end it there. So that way we have plenty of time for um, questions for Penny and I uh, with everything we've covered today. Um, I, I, I did want to just mention, uh, you know, Maria also put an emphasis on this and, and uh, just actually reminded me of a, uh, a case that I had uh, yesterday. And uh, we could not figure out why this patient's um, uh, became uh, acidotic. The pH, you know, went down to 729, the PCO2 went up to 61, and we could not figure this out. Now, a couple things, I don't have any um, um, uh, hard data on this, but what we've found over the past, I would say, 10 years of working with organ donors is that the um, uh, frequent use of marijuana has actually um, changed the um, expiratory um, gas flow patterns on these patients. So they have a lot of expiratory flow limitations. And this was a patient that we had, and again, I could not figure out what the heck was going on, why she became so acidotic, and then uh, zoomed in on the settings and noticed that um, uh, accidentally someone, instead of setting the uh, T low to 0.8 seconds, the P low was set to 0.8 seconds. And that was just enough to create resistance. When we got rid of the P low, put it back to zero, the uh, pH went to 735, the PCO2 went down to 45. It was just amazing. So again, if there, uh, as Maria said, if your peak expiratory flow rate is already hindered, by, for whatever reason, uh, some chronic obstructive lung disease or some other type of uh, expiratory flow limitations, when you add even more resistance in there, you get that, um, uh, that uh, acidosis or that resistance. Yeah, I, I want to add that on, on to that, uh, Penny, about the flow patterns too. Especially now, uh, everyone's, uh, you know, worried about, um, you know, patients uh, with COVID, we're adding, um, we're adding all these expiratory filters, you know, inspiratory, expiratory filters. Um, we forget to change them. And I've seen patients that the waveform also changes, the peak expiratory flow rate changes because now there's an added resistor, a filter that was, it hasn't been changed for days. And now that flow pattern also changes. So again, as Penny mentioned earlier, you know what the patient's flow pattern looked at one point and now it, it's not like they develop COPD overnight. It, you know, pay attention to, uh, especially if we're using all these filters now on our circuits, that, that we still need to change them because that will affect your waveform and your ventilation. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, um, uh, even even further, Maria, the, the, you know, the case you showed and the, the waveforms you showed, uh, you remember we had the one patient that uh, she was um, uh, 80 pounds soaking wet. I mean, she was so tiny. And uh, um, fell down a flight of stairs, was intubated, had some facial fractures, et cetera. And she um, was at total lung capacity. I mean, had inverted diaphragm. So she was a true copd or was a known copd -er. And uh, so, of course, we're not going to recruit those lungs. So we had the TLO set to um, uh, 1.8 seconds and the T high set to 1.4, cause you have to bulk ventilate. But as Maria said, whenever you, um, she got fluid overnight, she had a lot of collapse, and um, all of a sudden that peak expiratory flow rate went from 20 liters to 50 liters. She became restrictive. Her, her settings completely changed. Now this is someone who had obstructive lung disease, but then had a, um, uh, a restrictive component added on top of that 
So her TLO went to uh, 0.6 seconds. And then once uh, we re-recruited the lung, diureased her, all of a sudden her peak expiratory flow rate went back down to 20 liters. So it, it really is a guide. It's a metric that you can watch. I'm not saying this replaces um, uh, you know, uh, studies, uh, you know, it's not an FEV1, it's no, I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying it can help guide you to uh, your settings because the last thing we wanted to do when she had inverted diaphragms was recruit her. Uh -huh. yeah, I'm just talking. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to mention we have a few questions that are coming over, and okay. so. Um, for both, and we've been sending a couple to you, Maria, and a couple to you, Penny. Wanted to make sure that you have the ability to look at those questions. If not, I'm happy to read them for you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think the first one, Maria, I'll grab uh, because where can I get more in information on using APRV? If you bear through our growing pains, um, we do have a website, APRV Network. Dot org and what we've done if you click on the top banner you'll find we created several documents we have rescue guidelines because as Maria said rescue is so much different from your standard post-operative respiratory failure or your easy patient you're going to have much briefer T highs briefer T lows um, so that's rescue uh, there's a lot of other documents uh, talking about the evolution and, and adjustments and and release volumes in APRV etc but as as I said, bear through our growing pains, but we're we're building that site, and hopefully that'll be useful for you. Um, I, I don't know if you see the questions, Maria. If you want to take uh, patients that have spontaneously effort, but the rates in the high 30s to 40s, what would you adjust? Um, I, I uh, jokingly a lot of times say. Uh, maybe remove the offend, offender that might be the visitor. <laughs> um, uh, why, why, why is the patient breathing? So you have to find the root of the problem. So why is the patient breathing 30 times a minute? Is it because they still have so much collapse um, that, that that is not spontaneously breathing, that's panting. You don't want panting. So um, is it from pain? Is it from, are they getting septic? What is the source? Can you determine what that source would be? And then um, if it's low lung volume, you might need to increase your P high. If the T low is not set correctly and they keep de-recruiting, um, you might need to set your T low appropriately. If your T high is too long and you're making the patient do too much work and uh, making them take care of too much of their minute ventilation, you might need to reduce that T high. So there's a few things. The P low would be something we would never change unless somebody s slipped it in there and added it on you. But um, uh, other than that, um, uh, I think first clinically see if you can uh, resolve the problem there. Then move to the ventilator. Yeah, I just I just now able to see the questions. Uh, next one: How do you determine that the patient is ready to stretch the T high during rescue settings? Um, looking at when you're able to, when you're really able to ventilate, as the example I showed, when the CO2 uh, patient, the guy within normal, they were starting to ventilate, then you start, you start taking baby steps out, not the normal, I'm at five seconds, I'm going to go to six seconds, I might be at two seconds and go from 2.0 to 2.3, because and then the, sh the shorter your T high is, the more um, you're affecting the respiratory rate, if you calculate it out. Uh, a change from two to three is going to make a, a bigger effect on the respiratory rate versus five to six. Yep. Um, uh, any specific recommendations for APRV and COVID? Um, I don't know if you have anything, Maria, but what we've found um, with we actually worked with people all over the United States and abroad um, during the height of COVID. And what we found was, as with anything, the earlier, the, the better. Um, uh, these patients, um, they, they had a drive to breathe like we've never, ever seen before. And it was amazing that Patients were just working and working, and they didn't even realize that they were working that hard. They denied that, you know, that they were they were short of breath. Um, but uh, what we did find in our 
um, uh, experience is that using it early um, seemed to be uh, successful. Um, uh, as with anything, using it late uh, really wasn't, but almost all these patients at some point had to be paralyzed because of their drive to breathe. So I don't know if you saw anything else, Maria. I know, I think just um, anything I um, remember seeing with some of these COVID patients was some of them were recruiting. Once you recruited them, you, you had these really great gases. Um, and as we talked about signs of de-recruitment, looking at the TILO, at the, at the waveforms, um, you need to look for the signs of recruitment and knowing when to back off on, on the PHI or when you're needing to stretch out the TILO. Yeah. Um, Another question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Do you want to take that one, Maria? Uh, um, just I see patients plateau pressures on a cyst control mode being 38. Would you use a PI 40 in the 40s to begin? I mean, Penny, I would just always say start with the same plateau pressures um, when I transition over. Yeah, absolutely. In, in pure volume mode, you're going to use your plateau. If you're in pressure control or um, any type of pressure regulated, then typically you use the peak because it's very similar to the plateau. Um, I can tell you that um, you will shudder when you hear this, I'm sure. And I worked with a physician at the height of COVID in New York, and she was so funny because the uh, PIP was, um, uh, you know, the transitioning pressure was 48. And so she said, okay, she said, so I'm going to set my P high to 35. <laughs> I said, darling, you're going to have to do 48, you know, and she said, you're crazy. And I said, what pressure is being generated to get that tidal volume? She goes, 48. And I said, yeah. And it feels a lot different setting it than what it re results in. But in that case, that's your P high, 48. If you undercut it, I can guarantee you APRV will fail and then it will be the mode that failed. So, um, uh, you know, if you're using pressure control or um, uh, some type of, um, you know, pressure regulated, you use your PEEP, uh, PIP, uh, sorry, and then if you're using pure volume, you would use your plateau. Um, there's one, uh, what are some of the indications that will guide a therapist to use APRV instead of conventional? Um, uh, comfort, uh, that's one thing. Um, uh, allowing patients to spontaneously breathe. I always like to say there is no synchronization of CPAP. So it really is CPAP with release. Um, our institution, we, we don't use neuromuscular blocking agents. And in a very, very rare circumstance do we use that. Um, patients are allowed to breathe, um, uh, you know, as soon as possible. And they, once you regain FRC, they're very comfortable. Uh, so again, beyond that, I think it's going to be a comfort level. Uh, the other thing, Maria and I have done several case studies and um, presented the um, CO2. We did some work on looking at head injured patients. And you can... Um, get CO2 clearance with half the minute ventilation of conventional modes. And that I think is important because the lung is not undergoing stress strain, open, close, open, close. With half the minute ventilation, if you can get that, um, uh, that um, uh, CO2 clearance, it's 30% more efficient, uh, you know, using APRV. Next question is, do you ever combine APRV with proning? Um, yes, we do. Um, and I have to say, we've, at Shock Trauma, we've been proning since I started there, it seemed like in the early 90s. And I know, uh, Penny's mentioned this before, um, you know, Dr. Hibashi was brought to Shock Trauma for, um, for ECMO. And as you start using APRV as a rescue and combining you know, APRV and proning, patients didn't need ECMO any, anymore. So. Uh, we have you know, patients come in to shock trauma with severe RDS. It seemed like putting these patients in APRB and proning them um, really made the made the difference. Yeah, and and Maria, that's another also good reason for spontaneous breathing because if you transition them over early to APRV, when you pull gas in by using a sinusoidal pure spontaneous breath you can recruit the dependent areas which is truly the need for uh, proning 
because everything behind the spine is collapsed. That's why you're proning people. So if you can get them on APRV early, let them start spontaneously breathing. Uh, as Maria said, we've uh, basically eliminated proning. Um, I think there's one here. My institution APRV was used a few times. The main concern was about excessive release tidal volumes. So plain CPAP was used. Uh, to me, it may be the TILA was not adjusted properly. Does the release make such a great difference versus not using them plain C, uh, CPAP in an actively breathing patient? Um, are release volumes very important? And I would say yes in a patient that's sick. And the reason is because those patients, that metabolic load is just too much. So you will see an increased work of breathing in pure CPAP. Even if you do CPAP of 30, you have to augment CO2 removal somehow to offer the patient an offload of that metabolic component. So, um, and, and I don't know if you use uh, any of those ventilators that I showed, but I, you know, there is a chance that the excessive release volume was a byproduct of the ventilator and not necessarily the mode. So you're correct that the TLO may not have been set correctly. There's a lot of protocols out there that say use 40, 60% of the release. You're going to have bigger volumes. It's going to end up with a lot of collapse, and you're going to have more problems with CO2. Yeah, I just want to add to that about the, the large release volumes. As we've talked about, your TLO has to be set appropriately. But as Penny and I went through this driving pressure uh, study, patients that were rescued with APRV, we found um, release volumes as small as, you know, four cc's, four mils per kilogram per ideal body weight. So it's not true that you always have large release volumes. Um, if, if they're large, check your T-low, but is it because you've used it from the time of intubation, you're keeping, you know, keeping the lungs open. Um, so yeah. um, I think it was really neat. The rescue is how small the release volumes were. You're absolutely right, Maria, and we actually have a really good paper on that at, on the aprvnetwork.org site, and it's exactly as you said. We transitioned over complete collapse on, from low tidal volume strategy, which was at 5 cc's per kg, and with our transition, we were down to 4-something, and as mm -hmm. the lung volume, not tidal volume, but as the lung volume grew, the angle of the slope uh, got flatter, we adjusted, and then we were able to come down on our airway pressure. So the tidal volume only went up as a surrogate of recruitment and lung volume. Um, I think the last two are Next kind question. of combined. Um, uh, and, and I think, Maria, you can definitely jump in here. Any suggestions for navigating the pitfalls um, as a standard of care and getting buy-in from buyers? And the following question was, do you think it will become more commonly used? Um, I think it is becoming more commonly used. People are becoming more comfortable with it. Uh, they find it, um, uh, you know, we didn't rename the mode, but we labeled a method. And that method is time controlled because time is essential adaptive and it is because it is adaptive to the patient that t low should not be looked at as 0 0.5 0 0.6 seconds it should be looked at as 75 percent 75 percent of whatever that patient has so um uh you know uh the buy-in and you know um i think as people if you start using it for post-operative rescue using it earlier and not waiting until you have that patient you know who needed a p high of 48 and a t high of uh, two seconds and you know is on three pressers that's probably not the person to cut your eye teeth on and and uh, get started so um i think uh we have had a lot a lot more physicians or understanding it and understanding the physiology behind it. I don't know if you have any other suggestions, Maria, to how to get people to buy in. Well, I mean, my big thing as a respiratory therapist and an ECMO specialist, I I urge all, all of you RTs to learn this mode, but also to uh, ask your provider, why can I at least try switching the mode on the ventilator before I cannulate the patient? I just have a big issue with that, you know, because we've seen APRV work. Why not try that 
uh, before actually doing such an invasive procedure to a patient. Yeah, and, and Maria, a lot of times people say, well, you can't use it because it causes barotrauma. Well, um, I, I can guarantee you that I can offer you as many papers on APRV causing barotrauma as I can on the um, uh, success of lung rest. <laughs> that, you know, th there really, there is no data that I've seen yet to sh demonstrate that APRV alone as a mode causes barotrauma. In fact, they did some studies where they looked at over 8,000 patients and there's not one particular marker as a setting that caused um, barotrauma. The closest thing that they saw was either the healthy state of the lung or the illness of the lung and driving pressure. And we looked at 200 patients and APRV had the lowest driving pressure. So as Maria said, you know, request, can I at least do that before I do a very invasive procedure that isn't risk-free? Next question, what is PHI that represents FRC in your experience? Very high PHIs probably are more close to TLC and very uncomfortable through the patients. The PHI really depends on each patient. You, know, you can't say, well, PHI represents FRC, depends what's going on with your patient. If your PHI, this is a nice, nice thing about APRV, if your PHI, if you're actually a TLC, the patient's gonna try to protect their lung volume. They're gonna defend their lung volume. You're gonna see them, they're gonna give you the signs, hey, your my pressure is a little too high. You're going to see them forcing to exhale. So exhalation is usually a passive, but if you see a patient forcing to exhale and interpreting also the waveforms, you'll know if if your patient's recruiting and, and hitting TLC. Exactly. And and what if what if a P high of 50, which you know again we've seen, moves a patient from residual lung volume to um, FRC? then that actually is, you know, the lowest um, uh, for your um, uh, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. We have come off all vasoactives with a P high of 50 because, the, you know, the heart does not want to work at both extremes of lung volume. Pulmonary vascular resistance is at its highest. So what you need to do is find FRC. You're right, we don't want a P high that puts somebody at TLC. That's not the goal. The goal is to get to FRC. Next question, comment is someone transition a patient to APRV. Your CO2 went from 70 to 140 and you use a T high of four. Uh, uh, and what was your respiratory rate before transitioning? This sounds, this is a rescue patient with a CO2 of 70. So you really need to match the respiratory rate when you're transitioning these type of patients over. Yep, and I think the last one that I have here is for a PB840, would you use the pressure support? to zero or the 100% tube compensation. So again, we would not use pressure support because that is delivered on top of the P high. We would use tube compensation. 